Hello everyone and welcome to Lush and Salty Aquariums. My name is Stefan and thank you for coming to the channel. In my last video covering this 135 gallon freshwater display tank, we talked about a couple problems that I had with it and, and hopefully solved and did a brief overview of the system. And when I asked people if there's anything in particular they'd like to learn about or talk about or have me showcase regarding this aquarium uh, a number of folks highlighted the sump so that's what we're going to do we're going to talk about the filtration system i use on this aquarium it's not a canister system which is what a lot of people might have opted for uh, i chose to go with a sump for a number of reasons one the main one because i would need two canisters two big Awaze or fluval canisters to do a legitimate job uh, of filtration in a heavily stocked planted aquarium at 135 gallons. So I opted for trying a sump, which is something I had when, uh, when I was using this aquarium for a marine system in California. With a marine aquarium, Lots more people use a sump to filter it for a number of reasons. Uh, they can use reactors, they can uh, use a refugium. There, there's a number of things a saltwater aquarium require that freshwater systems do not, and a sump uh, is ideal for uh, dealing with those situations. But that is not to say a sump cannot be a fantastic way to go about filtering your freshwater aquarium. I would say any aquarium over 100 gallons, you really need to think about using a sump in lieu of canisters. Uh, I love canister filters and I would have used them in this if, if I didn't have that size issue. And after some research and discussion with people I trust in this hobby, I opted to go with a sump. Plus, I wanted to learn how to maintain um, this particular apparatus, this system, this uh, intricate but fantastic and fascinating, basically an aquarium under the aquarium. So the first cool thing about a sump that you can say to some extent with a canister, but really much more legitimately with a sump, is that it adds more gallons of water to your aquarium's footprint. All right, so if this is 135 gallons, and let's just say, I think this is a 60 gallon, it could be only a 40 uh, gallon sump, and I'll talk about sizes in a second. You're adding that many uh, more gallons of water to your overall uh, footprint in many ways, not in all ways, but in many ways, which means you can stock more, uh, upstairs here and you can do more things because you have more water running through the ecosystem and that's something you know in a canister even the big ones you're you're not getting nearly uh, the real estate from a pure out and out water perspective so some definitely is cool in that regard the other thing that's nifty about a sump and there's there's plenty and you know so when i say the other thing i'm just basically going to uh <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind and let's talk about what my camera is looking at right now this is a refugium basically so in a saltwater system you'd put chato in here some kind of moss to pull out nitrates from the water and uh, and maybe to grow some pods and stuff and you can you can grow scuds and shrimp and in any number of things in a refugium along with obviously the plants. Now the plants are key here because they're an element and I'm sort of going backwards. I mean the first part of the sump is over here but I'm going to kind of reverse engineer this video and start with the refugium. In the refugium I've got my prerequisite pothos and I've stuck them onto these cool little like shower uh, apparatus where people put their toothbrushes in and, and I just uh, reuse them, repurpose them for putting in uh, cuttings from different pothos and you can see what it's doing and the rootstock goes down and as the water comes 
excuse me, comes down through the overflow in the back into this the sump and works its way through the, the sponges and the media, um, these wonderful rootstock will pull uh, even more out of the water column, even more nitrates, uh, and basically provide a natural and awesome filtration. In addition, there's something just totally fun about having a planted tank underneath your planted tank. And I've got God knows how many uh, Neocaridina. I've seen some fish fry in here, like I talked about in the previous video, a few fry that I would feed the big fish upstairs. When I say upstairs, I mean up here, uh, would escape and then they would, some have made them down, made it down into here. I also have a Siamese algae eater that was fin nipping. There, you know, that's a big amount of shrimp. Uh, and you see they're in there as well. But I have an SAE in here. I had pulled him from the main aquarium because he was fin nipping and I just threw him in here and he's leading his best life because Lord knows um, there's certainly things for an algae eater to eat in a sump. Uh, it goes without saying. And that's another thing. If you're cultivating your algae down here, it's just less likely to f get a foothold in your main aquarium. Um, I'm using, and I'll get back to the refugium in a minute, but this is a CHA pump. Um, you, you just basically buy the pump that aligns with the size of the sump you're choosing. And I've had no problems with this pump, and I've also had no problems maintaining it. After about a year, uh, when I turned off the motor, I pulled it out and did a simple cleaning. There's a YouTube video, it was easy and it's really powerful, really reliable. CJ uh, is just the gold standard when it comes to water pumps. There were plenty of cheaper options, but this wasn't a place where I wanted to go uh, cheap. Now here is a, there's sort of a diaphragm here. I don't use it for anything, but you could put um, a kind of a sponge, maybe if you're having a problem with a specific uh, nitrite or phosphate or nitrate, you could lay a square sponge right in that diaphragm there. Excuse the reverse. Um, right now I'm just letting the roots from all these plants sort of migrate into that space. And I did put um, a little bit of a break from the larger slits with this uh, stuff I got at a garden center or um, a hobby shop, a simple plastic. You know, those in the hobby, you end up buying this stuff for any number of reasons. I use it as a as a filter to keep big chunks of junk coming into, there's the SAE, you saw his tail there, so they don't block the uh, filter pump here. And then of course all the root stocks. I've got an aquarium within the aquarium within the aquarium. When I first set it up, I put this little cube aquarium in here with some substrate um, to plant some stem plants. If I had to do it all over again, I would not do this. If anything, it blocks some of the pure flow uh, going from left to right. And it's really not necessary because if you use hornwort or water sprite, which is what I'm using, primarily water sprite, you don't need a substrate. Um, and I didn't want a substrate on the bottom. I've seen people do that, but I don't want to have to ever pull it all out uh, after a couple years to do a cleaning. And it's just totally not necessary, in my opinion. Um, maybe there are good reasons for using a substrate down in the sump, but and I have it in this tank within a tank, but this is one thing I would not do if I did it all over again. It hasn't caused me any problems that I'm aware of, but I bet you the sump would be just that much more efficient if it didn't have this uh, glass block in there. So um, that's a, that's, so that happened. I may pull it out eventually and just let the water sprite and hornwort do what it wants to do without this impediment. But for now, it's still in here. Um, and that's another thing. If you have a bully fish like that Siamese algae eater that See if I can find him. Gosh darn it. I see him whenever I'm working on it. Uh, but if you have a bully fish and you want to kind of give him a time out, you can just throw him in the sump. It's the same water. You don't have to even, you don't have to think about it. You can net him and toss him in. 
if you have unexpected baby fish, if you have bought something at a swap and you don't, you know, it's you're not sure quite how to acclimate or what to do. You've always got this sump as an option. And um, it's fun to maybe uh, try and get a crap ton of cherry shrimp or something if you're, if you're in the market for selling them. They're gonna be happier in here without predators than in a, than in a tank like this, right? So, and you saw one of the Amano shrimp. I don't even know if I put Amano shrimp in here, but he came through, they will, uh, get through the overflows, which the overflow here is in the center, it's up top, and then I've got the two outflows on either side of the aquarium. Um, they will make it through the overflow uh, over time, and that's not a problem because they'll just live down here. And you know, when you're growing pods, like if you wanted to grow scuds or something, you start a colony in here, some of them are gonna make it through here and just get pushed up into the aquarium through the pump and they, you know, maybe one, maybe a percentage will die in that process, but many won't. And so in the saltwater hobby, people just use copepods down here, their main hive, their main colony, and they let the sump just push them into the aquarium. And like over the course of the evening, who knows how many dozens or hundreds might be blown into the fish tank and get eaten. Over here, and there's some in here too. I have biological, I have bags of biomedia, sea uh, matrix, uh, biohome, uh, lava rock, you know, anything, just bag after bag. And after about a year, I pull all the bags out and clean them in tank water and just stack them up and, and put them back in. And so obviously more pothos, things like that, which don't require much of an anchor. And you, I can't do anything about this stability bar here, so I'm trying to navigate around it. But I also have a sort of black, uh, well not sort of a black plastic uh, holder, if you will. And then on top of it, I put a clear sort of, uh, I don't know the right vocabulary word. It's a box with holes in it. And in that, I put some sphagnum moss and the sphagnum moss and lava rock are in a container tray here. When I was trying to lower the pH in the, in the overall system, I did some research and sphagnum moss is a great way to do that. And when I was gonna keep just angelfish and some pretty exotic ones at that, I thought, uh, trying to lower even just a few fractions of a point, the uh, pH would be a, a good move. Now, the sphagnum moss is just in here as, as sort of a pseudo substrate for all these uh, pothos and other emerging plants. But that's another cool thing you can do. You can be so creative in how you handle your media, your refugium, your uh, care for livestock or bully fish, all these options are something you can do with the sump. And so you do need the biomedia, obviously that's key, and the more the better, and you can put more in a sump than any canister. There's no debate about that. It might be the best reason to think of a sump in lieu of a canister, just the sheer magnitude of biological media you can fit in there. You don't have to use the bags, but they make it a lot easier for maintenance. And then you see the water comes in from those two pipes on either side of the tank up there, goes through a little diaphragm, and down in this first compartment, um, you see, I use different layers of sponges. I use um, the heavier core sponge that stays in the tank for a longer period of time from, you know, there's fine, medium, and coarse. And then up here, I vary this. Right now, I am uh, I have an ammonia sponge sandwiched between two pieces of filter floss. I'm just trying to see if I can't get my ammonia closer to zero. It was slightly higher, I think, because of the treatments I was doing for the cantilanus worms. But that, that I change every week. I just throw that stuff out, the floss, and put new floss in. This, every six months or so, I'll just clean them out like the sponges in your uh, canister. Just, just squish them and squish them with tank water and put them back in. 
Uh, over here, this is not part of the sump. This is an ATO or auto top off. It's a five, uh, five gallon uh, cylinder, not cylinder, but canister, not canister, whatever, a container. And I have a little, uh, I think it's F zone ATO system, basically a cheap pump with a sensor that's over in here somewhere, down in here at the water line. And that way, if the sump starts to get too low, the sump will get lower before your tank does which is mostly a good thing. So when it does get lower than I want, that'll trigger this uh, reservoir, that's the word I was looking for, to pump more water into the sump and uh, give me more time if I'm away on a, a weekend or something or a, long, a longer period of time where I don't have to think about the water level. Um, but it, this is another interesting thing about uh, some folks is the water level goes down in here before it'll ever go down in here, which is kind of a cool thing because you're never gonna have to deal with, you know, that annoying half an inch at the, at the tank line. You're always gonna be seeing that activity here, which is fine because you can just, it's totally a utilitarian uh, system down here and the aesthetics don't really matter. Although it is aesthetically pleasing to me and I bet to some of you out there who, who want to grow scuds or, or some, you know, microfauna and neocaridina. I mean, <laughs> talk about living your best life. Uh, Predator-free plants, algae, all that good stuff. Uh, you don't need the ATO uh, to make all this work, but that's I have it, and it's been um, just basically a, a sure thing for me. This is, by the way, uh, made by Acrylic Habitats. I think they're a Texas company. There's their logo. They come in all different color forms. So you get blue, red, black, white, clear, and they come in, in various different sizes. I think this is the middle size. There's a smaller one and a larger one. Uh, so, you know, you just look at their specs, think about what your tank is. And then this is critical make sure you measure the space below your tank whatever this cabinet looks like it's got to be able to comfortably accommodate a sump and allow you the real estate to be able to work on it to be able to access all your other stuff your, your switches your your timers etc if you go too big and it doesn't fit you're shit out of luck it's got to fit you know so that's a key you can also do a DIY sump by just getting a 20 gallon long or a 30 gallon or a 40 breeder. People do that and they can just make little plastic dividers. Uh, but you know, I paid a little a premium to get one that's already been uh, furbished to the way that, you know, I can work with from Jump Street. I don't, I can start thinking about my media and operations before I uh, worry about creating separators and things of that nature. Uh, so that, I'm sure I'm missing something. And, oh, let me just add, this is also very important. I don't, there are companies and manufacturers that will put the um, overflow, the method for the water to go into the tank lower in, maybe using a pipe that sticks out of the back and, and sort of starts sucking water in in the center. And likewise, uh, these outflows, these uh, they look like power heads, but they're, let me just, since I'm doing this, let's do it right, folks. See, so there's one here and you can move it up or down like that. Keep everything close to the top because in the event of a power failure, um, the sump's gonna keep pulling water to the bottom. And if it's really high up here, the most you're going to lose is about, you know, a couple inches, which your sump will be able to accommodate without any flooding. If you put those power, uh, those power heads, those valves too low, or the inflow, if it's all just low in the tank, the siphon effect is gonna keep going and you will get a catastrophic flood. Now, when people uh, bitch about sums, that's something they, they complain about and understandably so, 
but the remedy is so simple and it's a lead pipes you know certainty it won't backfire on you is just put everything higher up in the tank towards the top so that when the water does move down it won't continue to move down and overflow the sump i haven't had one overflow in a year and a half let me knock on wood because that is every fish keeper's worst nightmare and you know canisters it happens in any system it can happen especially when variables like the power uh, fluctuate unexpectedly i have a couple lights up here these are just simple you can do anything you want i have a, uh, one that's stuck with a magnet up there i i have a couple plant grow lights here you can put a, a legit aquarium light and just stick it to the top there an el cheapo the cheapest tiger or you know something you've got in your fish room that's just gathering dust any light for water sprite or pothos and you'll be good to go um, every week as I said, I, I throw this, the floss away for the most part. Every six months, I might pull that stuff out and squish it out. I don't do a damn thing with this until, you know, at least a year, like, and then that, you know, then you turn everything off and it's a, it's a two hour job for sure. And I've only cleaned the pump once and you can see for whatever I'm not doing or doing, look at how clean it is. There's not full of gunk or, gunk or crap. So the sump is, pulling all that before it gets to the motor. So clearly it's working, right? And my parameters are generally excellent in the, well, I'm not gonna lie, they're not generally excellent. I do have about 20 to 30, sometimes even a spike to 40 nitrates, but mostly zero, zero ammonium and nitrite. And then pH, uh, I wish it was a couple points lower so that that initial, the initial effect of using sphagnum moss uh, did work, but uh, it's 7.4 is my pH. I would love it to be 6.8, 7.0. Chicago tap water, mine anyway, is about 7.2. So, you know, 7.4, uh, I'm not keeping Altum Angels and, and all these other fish can handle hard water, water. Some even prefer it. And when I say hard, I mean with higher pH. Uh, and there you have it. So this is the Siamese Algeter that wasn't a bully, but he's certainly huge. Uh, and I just talked about this aquarium, so don't get me started there. I hope uh, this has given you a really comprehensive look at um, what I do for my particular sum and what you might be able to do in your larger aquariums. Okay, everybody, uh, as usual, questions, comments, deeply appreciated. Until then, always keep your hands in the tank and ciao for now.